a big warm welcome Emmanuel family and everyone else who's joining us today. There are many exciting things happening at our church and you can access these details on our website which is www.emmanuelchichester.com The theme this week is dedication and celebration and celebration is exactly what our family have been doing this week. We have had prayers answered, we have harvested from the garden, we have discovered tadpoles in our brand new pond. We've had our granddaughter stay from Bristol and I've even managed to book a hair appointment. Freya. Hi Emmanuel family, it's Freya. I am missing you all because we won't get to see each other at New Wine where we have lots of fun together. Stay safe and hope to see you next time I'm here. Bye. Now Paul Collins, our senior minister, wants to explain how we are going to be moving forward as a church. Paul. Hi Emmanuel, I've just got some news and really want to update you about where we are heading uh, currently as a church, what we're thinking about with the news that the government have brought out about uh, acts of worship now being allowed to take place uh, with social distancing in uh, measures in place in buildings. Uh, so obviously we haven't been able to move forward without permission of the school because we don't own our own building. We are obviously tenants and without their permission we have no right to meet. However, uh, myself and Mark have been liaising with uh, Central School and we're really pleased to announce that they have now agreed that we start to meet at least during the summer holidays uh, and uh, we're allowed to meet again in person. That's really exciting news and we are really looking forward to being able to doing something. Now that does mean that we'll have to do something different. Church will of course look different. It cannot look the same as what it used to. We can't get the numbers into central and socially distance as we would have uh, in uh, prior to lockdown and prior to the COVID situation. So Rather than ruining the uh, service that we're doing at the moment and potentially risking uh, IT issues and everything like that, we're, we're thinking about continuing with our Sunday service uh, on YouTube as it is currently delivered and doing something in addition to that, perhaps at a different time on a Sunday, maybe later on in the day and looking at live streaming that to try the technology, but with a collected congregation. Now that will obviously have to be managed through numbers and we may have to uh, put some sort of ticketing effectively in place through Church Suite so that we only get the number of people that we're allowed to get into place. We are going to get more details out. We've got to do some risk assessments but we're really hoping that uh, at next Sunday that we'll be able to have something in place. Now it may not be every week that we do it but we certainly want to be doing some trials during the summer holidays to see if the technology will work to live stream as well as uh, have a real uh, in-person service so that as we move forward in this situation we can look at slowly introducing our Sunday morning services to a live stream uh, and also gathered community so that those people that want to come and can come can but also recognizing that some of you can't come for whatever reasons maybe because of the numbers we can get in or maybe because you're isolating and you're just not able to join us in person we do not want to exclude you in any way so that's what we're thinking about more information will be coming out please do keep an eye out on our website and the newsletters because that's how we're going to communicate you communicate what's happening and where we're going to be moving forward. We are really excited and it's great news. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done in our lives this week. Prepare us for the coming week. Help us to hear your voice today. Lead us through all the challenges ahead. And thank you for your love and your faithfulness. Amen. Your 
faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, God. True are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. You never fail, oh God. And so we raise our holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Raise up holy Okay.
gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in Come to the well that never runs dry Drink of the water, come and thirst no more Come all you sinners, come find his mercy Come to the table, he will satisfy Taste of his goodness, find looking for for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms For God so loved the world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him will live forever Now it is well I'm walking in freedom For God so loved God so loved the world So praise God Praise God From whom all blessings flow Praise Him Praise Him His one and only Son to save us For God so loved The world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him Will live forever The power of hell Forever defeated Now it is God so loved, God so loved the world. So bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms Jesus is waiting there with open arms Jesus is waiting with open arms. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is.
vision up for me. That is your grace, is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. God of Jacob, you use the weak to lead the strong. Yeah, you do. You lead us in the song of your salvation.
seen what you can do Oh God of wonders Your power has no end The things you've done before In greater measure You will do again Cause there's no prison Wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move All things are possible and There's no broken body you can't raise No soul you can't save All things are possible In the darkest night You can light it up you can light it up Oh God of revival Let hope arise Death is overcome You've already won Oh God of revival You rose in victory Seated forever on the throne So why should my heart fear What you've defeated I Trust in you alone Cause there's no prison Wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move All things are possible there's no broken body you can raise No soul you who can't save All things are possible In the darkest night You can light it up You can light it up Oh God of revival Let hope arise Death is overcome God of revival, pour it out, pour it out Every stronghold will crumble Your chains hit the ground oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out Come awaken your people Come awaken the city oh God of revival, Change.
Today we are going to be led in prayer by Mark. This week I've been thinking about what is prayer and why do we struggle with it? I think we all agree that prayer is important, but for most of us, that's me as well as you, it's not a priority. I confess it's not my first thought in many situations. At its simplest, prayer is communication or rather, communion with God. If God is the best thing in our lives, then being with him must be the best. But, God is scary. If he's not, then your God's too small. He is holy, and he knows everything about me and you. That's scary. The good news is that he's also in love with us. Recently I started meditating on the Song of Songs. It's a rather racy song at face value. But the Bible describes Jesus as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. So a song about his feelings for us and ours for him should be passionate. In chapter 1 it says, No wonder all the women love you. Take me with you. Come, let's run. It expresses our honest desire for God. So let's start by praising him. We start with adoration or praise or thanksgiving. There's much to praise praise God for. 
but I'm often lost for words, so a psalm is a good place to go. This is Psalm 100 from the New Living Translation, a psalm of thanksgiving. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord in, with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is good. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. But there is a problem in chapter one continues with don't stare at me because I'm dark. I couldn't care for myself, my own vineyard. Dark here does not really mean colour my skin, but to put it in one word, it means sin. And with sin comes shame, excuses, blame. There is a solution. If we're Christians, we have forgiveness. But we still have sins, stuff we need to admit to ourselves and before him. After all, he already knows. So we come to confession. Again, I'm using a psalm. This one is Psalm 32, again from the New Living Translation. A psalm of David. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Pause. Finally, I confess all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Pause. Confession is good, but not enough. In chapter two, we, we read, Catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of our love. We need not only to recognise and name our sins, but we need to repent. That is, reject them and turn away from them. Start with the small ones, because if they're left unattended, they will become bigger. This is called repentance. So finish off the rest of that psalm. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Pause. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be <clears throat> like the senseless horse or mule that needs a bit or bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all those whose hearts are pure. I've not got far into the song so far, so I'm going to cheat a bit for this last section and go back to chapter one. There it says, Strengthen me with raisin cakes. Refresh me with apples, for I am weak with love. God already knows what we need and what we want, but he encourages us to ask. It's partly just about communication, but it's also about recognising our dependence upon, <coughs> sorry, our dependence and our need of God. We call this petition and intercession. Here are a few short prayers. First of all, for COVID-19. 
Lord, with one voice we ask you to eradicate COVID-19 and bring healing to our nations. For our leaders. Lord, guide and encourage our leaders at this time. Thank you for the effort that goes into producing these videos each week. Help Paul and Lou, along with the leaders and trustees, plan for a return to meeting face to face. But most of all, guide them in how to encourage us as a church to fulfil your mission for us, to make disciples. Finally, for the government. We ask for wisdom for Boris, the cabinet, the whole government, to try and restore our land, but more especially to care for the poor, the disadvantaged in our society. We bring these prayers in the name of Je uh, Father, I call Papa, and his Son, Jesus, and in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Mark. If you would like to reach for your Bibles, our Bible reading today is from Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27 to the end. Church. Our reading this morning continues the story of Nehemiah and describes the dedication of the rebuilt wall of Jerusalem. And it can be found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 12, verses 27 to the end. At the dedication of the walls of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps and lyres. The musicians also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Nephthites, from Beth Gigal, from the area of Jeba and Asmabeth, for the musicians had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people the gates and the walls. I had the leaders of Judea go up on top of the walls. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right towards the Dunkate of Hoshea and half the leaders of Judah followed them, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemamiah, Jeremiah, as well as some priests with trumpets and also Zechariah, son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zachur, the son of Asaph, and his associates, Shemir, Azarel, Milanai, Galilee, Maya, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanani, with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. Ezra, the teacher of the law, led the procession, at the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall and passed above the site of David's palace to the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall, together with half the people, past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, over the gate of Ephraim, the Jesh Jeshana Gate, the Fish Gate, the Tower of Hanel, and the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Sheep Gate. At the Gate of the Guard, they stopped. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. So did I, together with half of the, of the officers, as well as the priests. Elikiam, Masaya, Miniamin, Micaiah, Elioni, Zachariah, and Hananiah with their trumpets, and also Marsea, Shemamai, Eleazar, Uzi, Jehoanan, Malchiai, Elam, and Ezra. The choir sang under the direction of Jezahiah, and on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Israel could be heard far away. 
that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storeroom the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did also the musicians and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there had been directors for the musicians and for the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the days of Zerubbabel and of Nehemiah, all Israel contributed the daily portions for the musicians and the gatekeepers. They also set aside the portions for the other Levites, and the Levites set aside the portions for the descendants of Aaron. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Now our Minister Paul is going to talk to us about dedication and celebration. Good morning, Emmanuel Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Paul. If we've not met before, it's great to uh, be able to be with you. And we continue through this book of Nehemiah. Uh, and we're nearly at the end. We're in the closing uh, chapters, chapter 12 today. You've heard it read to you. You now know the story of them coming together in this collective celebration of worship. Uh, now, celebration has been a theme throughout our uh, history as, as humanity. We celebrate significant events and uh, we uh, in our family celebrated a significant birthday earlier on this year as our eldest son Joshua celebrated his 18th birthday. Uh, but sadly due to lockdown it was not the celebration that we would hope for or, or expected. He couldn't take any of us down the pub to buy his first drink because we were all kept in our homes. And I know uh, probably many of you, like us in our family, have not been able to celebrate the significant events perhaps in your life or in the life of your family due to lockdown. And that's been a source of pain for you. And uh, as a church, we've not been able to get together for collective corporate worship. And I'm sure many of you, like me, have found that really difficult at times, have found it difficult not to be able to come together and to worship God in song as we would want to. So does Nehemiah offer any, uh, any insight, perhaps to give us any help on that? And I think the answer is yes. First of all, we need to examine what's going on. You see, we see this story and we think, ah, oh, life is great for these people. They're marching around the walls, they're having a great time and they're celebrating and they're worshipping. And that is true. But let's take a step back and look at them more objectively. These people, the Israelites, are still a dispersed community. They, have, they are still suffering the, the effects of their disobedience and the exile that God puts them in. They're a dispersed community. Some are, are left in the, the land of what we know to be Israel. Some are away in, a, in Assyria, have been held effectively captives. Whatever happens, they still are not a self-governing people. They have a occupying force over them. Now they have a degree of freedom, but they don't have complete freedom. Life is not a okay for them. It is still difficult. They are not self-ruling. But in the midst of this, they still come together and worship. I think that I have three things I want to look at. The first is can we, like the people of Israel, learn to worship in the bad times as well as the good? How can we do that? How can we learn to worship God when life isn't going well? You see, giving God worship when life is fantastic, when he's just doing everything that we want him to do, and when our life is amazing and everything's going so well, that's really easy. And to some extent, that can be quite cheap worship. It doesn't cost us very much because it just comes as an overflow of all of our excitement of where we're at. What's really difficult is costly worship. Can we learn, as the Bible says, to offer a sacrifice 
of worship, a sacrifice of praise to God, to worship him when it's not going well. And actually that's the mark of maturity for Christians, to learn to worship God in the pain and the suffering. Now, all worship, in fact, all discipleship, uh, according to Rowan Williams, as he's uh, a book I'm reading about at the moment, he reflects actually all discipleship and all worship comes, must come from a place of pain. Because we're associating ourselves with Jesus. We're supposed to, as call and called as disciples to, to be self-sacrificing, to offer ourselves completely wholly uh, to God as Jesus did. And, and the cost Jesus made was, was great. It was completely self-denying and it was costly and it starts from a point of pain. Can we learn to worship in the pain? Can we say, God, you are worthy of our worship. You are good no matter what our context. You are still good. And that song, as I was being reminded this week, as I was visiting someone in, uh, in a local hospice and, and they just spoke into my life as they reflected on the Matt Redmond song quoting the book of Job. Do you know the Lord gives and he takes away? He gives and he takes away and he it has the right to do that as God. But can we, as Job did, and as Matt and Beth Redmond did in their song, still say at the end of that, you are still worthy. Blessed be your name, even though it's difficult, even though I'm in pain, I'm in suffering, even though life is not going well for me, even though, as David commented in, the, in Psalm 23, I, I'm living in the valley of the shadow of death, but you, you Lord, are still God. You still sit enthroned on high. You are still sitting in the throne room of heaven and you are still worthy of my praise. And I will worship you. I make the choice to worship you and I will offer you that sacrifice of praise and worship. And it's costly. It hurts. And, it, and, and, I, and it's the, frankly, it's the last thing I want to do at the moment. It's not a natural response, but I'm choosing to do it. I choose worship in the in the midst of pain and suffering can we learn to do that it's the mark of maturity of a christian these people gather they march around the walls they're singing by and led by musicians they're singing by, uh, by, uh, and they're led by their priests and as we see that it says in Nehemiah that in the temple there are great sacrifices made, being made to honour God. And that brings me to point number two. Firstly, can we learn to worship God in the pain and the suffering when things are not going well? But point number two, can we learn to, can we learn to worship God in a, abundant sacrificial worship? You see, I had this picture in my head and uh, as we try to inhabit this story, as we try to inhabit the narrative of, uh, of these priests having great sacrifices, we, we, we sort of read over that and skip over it quite easily. But actually, if we think about what's going on. There's this t in the temple, there are animals being slaughtered as in sacrifice to God. It's, a, it's a, an, an image of, of well, uh, quite frankly, a very a bloody image. Uh, there's blood all over the place and carcasses all over the place of this worship of God through sacrificial worship and that was their custom. That's what happened in the temple worship. But let's be clear about this. Animals were a form of commodity. They were a livelihood for people. And so with great sacrificial worship, as the animals were offered in great abundance, Actually, it's incredibly costly. There is a huge sacrifice being made as people uh, either had to buy uh, animals to offer as sacrifices or they had to bring animals uh, to offer a sacrifice. It was really costly for them. There was a cost involved to this. They offered God the best. They said, God, we will give to you what, what we have in abundance here and it's going to cost us it's not just going to cost us emotionally but it's going to cost us in our pockets as well it's going to hurt us financially 
Oh, it's a message we don't like to hear nowadays in the church, but actually, does our worship really cost us anything? Or is it cheap worship? Now, I'm not talking necessarily about cheap worship financially as such, although that is part of it, but is our worship just cheap worship? We're offering him something, but not the best. And Malachi speaks about this. Malachi, Malachi when he prophesies uh, the last book of the Old Testament, he said, you try giving, you try giving what you offer to me, to your governors and see how they like it and see how they like it. He, um, God reprimands them for the, the cheap offering that they're making in worship. And he says, I will not stand for it. I will not stand for it. It's, you know, God does not need anything from us. But what he wants is us. And in, actually in cheap worship, we're actually holding something of ourselves back. And that breaks the heart of God, because actually what we're doing is holding our whole self back. And what God wants is to be restored into relationship and, and, and costly worship actually says, I'm coming to you it, with everything, God. I'm coming. You have, you have my everything. You are my everything and you have my everything. Everything I have is yours and God just delights in that because that is completely self-sacrificing worship it's the worship that Jesus gives to the father in Gethsemane completely self-sacrificing worship so worship is sacrificial it is costly and the third point I noticed in this is completely generous worship is not just sacrificial but it's generous there's an abundance in it. In the story of Nehemiah, we see that there's there's people employed by the temple to prefer, perform certain functions. There's the musicians, there's the priests, uh, there's all these people employed to make it happen. And the people of God come round and they recognise that and there's an abundance of generosity towards them. They sustain the worship of the temple through their generosity to the temple. Now, today in the Church of England, we have something called uh, the parish share. And the parish share is a, 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 a contribution that we as a church make to the diocese, which in turn goes to the central Church of England, which allows the Church of England to continue its worship, its ministry and its mission to this nation. Now, many people look at it and thinking they're just taxing us. They're taxing us so that they can get our money. But actually, we need to look at this story and be reminded that actually it's God's money anyway. And he requires us to be generous. And, and, and when we give to uh, when we give to the church, it's to sustain the mission, the ministry and the uh, and the work of the church in this nation, not just at Emmanuel so that you can pay for me and uh, for Paul and uh, and for everything else that happens in the life of Emmanuel. But actually, when we give, we're also supporting the work, the, the church nationally. We're supporting parishes that can't afford to have people employed as, as, as ministers and we're contributing towards their costs. And we're saying what well, they are important and the communities that they serve are important and we're being generous. And it's really difficult to be generous in these times when our economy seems to be collapsing. But I think that's one of the messages our church needs to hear. When the economy collapses, God says, my pockets have not got any shallower. I'm still generous. I still give and I give and I give. And I call my church to do the same. Self-sacrificial worship is also generous worship. And, and part of that generosity is in our financial giving. But also it's in our time. It's in our energies. It's in our efforts. It's in our relationships. It's a generosity of all of these things. It's a generosity of spirit. God doesn't just say, I want, I want your money. He says, I want you. I want you to be generous with everything you have. I want you to be to live a life of generosity because that's what I have done. I, I, I am a generous God and I give and I give and I give. Uh, and I just want to give you the best of everything. That's what God says to us. I, I'm, a, I'm a good God. 
And I give out of my goodness and I give out of my abundance. And I want my church to replicate that, to represent me to a world that thinks that God is stingy, that God is against you. And the church is called to represent God to a nation by abundance of generosity and, uh, and of worship and of self-sacrificial giving. So what is it this week that has caused you to joyfully worship the Lord in abundance in self-sacrifice or in generosity maybe it was a testimony a story that you've had a book you've read a sunrise a word of scripture something that you've just reflected on and out of that out of that has sprung this worship of God uh, and as we uh, reflected a, what, last week or perhaps a couple of weeks ago in the throne room of heaven there's just, just this abundance of worship and it's it's just beautiful to see and, and many of us who think it's dull and it's boring and there's these people of these angels these elders in heaven who fall down on their faces just go where where holy 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 are you god and they stand up and they see god again and they fall over and go holy 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 and you think oh gosh they're just spending all day getting up and going down and that's not the heart behind this is they look at God and every time they look at him they just, it's as if they get a fresh revelation of who he is and they just fall down and go oh it's this awesomeness Lord, Lord you're just so awesome you're so awesome and I fall down and I worship you now so what is it this thing that's led you to that the Westminster, or the Westminster Catechism says man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever I'm just going to repeat that man and by that, read and woman, uh, it was written quite a while ago. Uh, chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Here's the thing. We never stop worshipping in our lives. We just replace the thing that we choose to worship. So when we find ourselves moving away from the worship of God, usually we find something else sitting on the altar. And in my experience and my own life, it's usually that I find myself there. I've placed myself on the throne of my life and I need to boot myself off and say, God, have your rightful place. I choose to worship you. And the mark of maturity is when we can put God on the throne, we can keep God on the throne, we can worship God on the throne in the pain and the suffering. Worship is coming back to the heart of our being. It is about being in union with God and enjoying him. I mean, these days we find our lives very different from how we'd hoped or expected. Many of us are living in pain. Many of us are living in fear and anxiety. God has not stopped being good or being in control. This global pandemic has not sent God into a frenzy of panic and of worry and thinking, what's happening? I'm losing control. That is, nothing about this has, has, has uh, in any way phased God. He is still working for good. He is still in control. Whatever the pain that we're going through, whether that's the pain because we can't gather in our usual way and that's upsetting, or whether it's other pains, it's the economic uncertainty, the, the fat, or, or the pain of not being able to see your friends and your families as you would want to, or not being able to hug your grandchildren, any of those pains, God is still in control. He is still worthy of our praise. As Mike Pilavachi says, worship is for Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's to Jesus. And may God forgive us if we ever make it about anything else. If we ever make it about anything else or about ourselves. Let's return to the heart of worship. Let's acknowledge God for who he is for all that he's done for us. 
as these people of Israel, as they uh, journey through Nehemiah, we hear that they rebuilt the walls. They've come together, rebuilt the walls. They've heard the word of God re- read aloud to them. They've confessed their sins and they've recommitted themselves to God. And out of all of these acts has sprung this worship. And they are still in a difficult time. They're still in a difficult place, but they have been restored back to God. And out of that comes an abundance of sacrificial and generous worship to the one who alone is worthy. You may find yourself in a difficult time this week. You may identify with some of the pains I've spoken about and you may be saying, thinking to yourself, well, that's all right, Paul, you're in a different place from me and I am in a different place from all of you. But that doesn't mean that I and we at Emmanuel Church don't care. We want to stand alongside you. We want to help you through these difficult times whenever possible. And some of those ways could be practical ways. Some of them may just be to stand alongside you and pray for you. Commit this back to God and to try and help you restore that relationship with him and that worship of him. To put him back firmly in control of your life so that you look up to him rather than looking down at the place where you find yourselves in. To cast your eyes to him. And say, in all this difficulty, Lord, you are still in control and I will firmly fix my eyes on you and I will trust you. I will trust your goodness and I will trust your uh, mercy and your loving kindness towards me. We want to stand alongside you. At the end of the service today, we are going to be having coffee and fellowship afterwards on Zoom. But we're also going to have another Zoom code and that's going to be for prayer ministry because we believe that through the power of prayer, God changes situations It changes our own reality and we will pray for you. If you're watching this on Catch Up and you've missed the Zoom prayer ministry, then email us. Someone will be in contact with you over the phone and we will pray for you. The email address is prayer at emmanuelchichester.com. We want as a church to put God back on the throne, not just of our lives as individuals, but on the throne of our church as we worship him because he is so worthy. He's so worthy of our praise. God bless you. Have a great week. If you feel God has spoken to you today, or you would like prayer for anything, there is a Zoom code on the website which you can use when the service is finished, where we are waiting to pray with you. Otherwise, we can join together on Zoom for coffee and catch up by using a code given on the website. See you there. So let's share in a final blessing for this new week. Lord God, we rejoice in your greatness and power, your gentleness and love, your mercy and justice. Enable us by your spirit to honour you in our thoughts and words and actions and to serve you in every aspect of our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.